so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hello, uh, this is Kathleen. I'm extremely humbled and extremely grateful for being pardoned and released from prison. My eternal gratitude goes to my friends and family, especially Tracy and all of her family, and I would not have survived this whole ordeal without them. Today is a victory for science and especially truth. And for the last 20 years I have been in prison, I have forever and will always think of my children, grieve for my children and have missed them and love them terribly. Thank you. That's Kathleen Folbig, a 55-year-old mother of four, speaking in her own words for the first time in 20 years. With the help of her supporters, friends and legal team, She spent the last two decades fighting for freedom from inside a prison cell. In 2003, Kathleen was sentenced to 30 years with a non-parole period of 25 for the murders of three of her four children, Patrick, Sarah and Laura. She was also convicted of manslaughter of her son, Caleb. The charges saw her branded the most hated woman in Australia. Kathleen Folbig has always maintained her innocence, but it wasn't until a second inquiry into her convictions that new scientific developments led to revelations that three of her children could have died of natural causes. Earlier this week, in an historic decision, the New South Wales Attorney General Michael Daly made the extraordinary announcement that Ms Folbig has been granted a pardon by Governor-General Margaret Beasley. It triggered her immediate release from a Grafton jail. For these reasons, I'm firmly of the view that there is reasonable doubt as to Ms Fivig's guilt. And so, as you would expect over the weekend, I sought the appropriate advice and weighed up the options available to me very carefully. And so, considering Mr Bathurst's conclusion that he is firmly of the view that there is reasonable doubt as to Ms Fivig's guilt, I consider that his reasons establish exceptional circumstances of the kind that weigh heavily in favour of the grant of a free pardon, and that in the interest of justice, Ms Fobig should be released from custody as soon as possible. And so uh, this morning at 9.30, I met with the Governor. I recommended that the Governor should exercise the raw prerogative of mercy and grant Ms Fobig an unconditional pardon. The Governor agreed. Ms Fobig has now been pardoned. In the cases of Kathleen's daughters, Sarah and Laura Folbig, the recent inquest found there was a reasonable possibility that a genetic mutation led to their deaths. While what's been described as persuasive expert evidence suggests that one of Ms Folbig's sons, Patrick, may have died from an underlying neurogenetic disorder. Speaking outside court this week, Kathleen Folbig's lawyer said the system has failed her client at every step. Instead of trying to understand why her children died, potentially through an inquest, which was said should have happened all the way back in 2001, uh, we threw her in jail, locked her up, called her Australia's worst female serial killer, um, put her in solitary. So, I mean, how would any of you feel to have that happen to you? During her first night of freedom, Kathleen shared a pizza and garlic bread with her best friend, Tracy Chapman as the pair clinked their glasses in joyous disbelief over a celebratory Kahlua and Coke, Kathleen's favourite drink from back in the day. She slept for the first time in a real bed. She's made a cup of tea with real, in a real crockery cup and had real spoons to stir with, which sounds probably pretty basic to you all, but she's, she's grateful. Decent tea, you know, real milk, <laughs> and slept in a real bed last night. She said it was the first time she's been able to sleep properly in 20 years, even though it was brief last night. I'm Emma Gillespie, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. As the dust settles from this week's announcement, and as Kathleen Folbig begins to wrap her head around a new life of freedom, Attention has turned to understanding the failures that put her in jail. The scientific advancements that freed her 
and quashing her convictions once and for all. On today's episode, we're speaking with Dr. Xanthi Mallet about what comes next. Xanthi is a criminologist and forensic scientist at the University of Newcastle with a background in anthropology and behavioural sciences more broadly. Xanthi has spoken with Kathleen Folbig on multiple occasions over the years and she joins us today. Xanthi, you have been following this case for many, many years. How significant is the news this week, achieving this pardon from both a legal and I suppose a a historical perspective as well. What was your reaction? Well, it really doesn't get any bigger than this. This case has loomed large, certainly for me and for many people in Australia. For me personally, for a decade now, I first wrote about this case for a book called Mothers Who Murder and Infamous Miscarriages of Justice, which I published in 2014. And I actually began that book with the case of Lindy Chamberlain because I wanted people to read it with an open mind. Some of the women in the book were ultimately guilty of killing their children for various reasons. But Kathleen Folbig's case, along with Kelly Lane, were the ones who I raised issues with the case and suggested there may be reasonable doubt. And the reason for that was that there was never any evidence to suggest intentional harm by Kathleen towards the children. Each of them had a cause of death, which was provided by the pathologist at post-mortem. It was only the circumstance of four children's deaths in one family that really raised suspicions. And then the diary entries, which were interpreted as confessions of guilt, of intentional harm by Kathleen. I had concerns over this then, and I've basically been trying to raise awareness about this case since then because I believe that a woman may be wrongfully convicted. And so for me to watch it, you know, we've seen appeals, we've seen inquiries, we've seen the most recent inquiry, which hasn't even handed back its findings yet, but obviously we know what the outcome is going to be. I still can't quite get my head there, to be honest, for something I've waited for for 10 years. And now suddenly it's here, you know, it's kind of mind blowing. It's huge. It's huge in terms of this case, but also what it means to the criminal justice system, it's going to blow that wide open too. That sort of sentiment has been echoed by legal experts, scientific experts, other people in your field for a long, long time. Why did it take 20 years to get to this point? Well, I think that's another great question, isn't it? So I think the law likes finality. When somebody has been found guilty, it's incredibly difficult for that person to have an appeal granted. I think some people in the public think it's easy. I was listening to some of the discussion around this earlier and people going, well, if I was Kathleen Fobig, I would have just kept appealing and appealing and appealing until I got a result. And I'm thinking the law does not work that way. It simply doesn't allow people to keep appealing and appealing and inquiries. So it's already been an extraordinary case in that the appeal was rejected that was found there wasn't grounds and grounds for an appeal are actually very difficult it's new or compelling evidence fresh evidence it can't be evidence that was available at the time of the original conviction that would be discounted it can't be simply because you've had a bad defense you know so it's actually very strict on the grounds you're allowed to appeal and then we've had obviously inquiries which is incredibly unusual so there's always been this groundswell of problem with this case that were obviously recognized by enough people to keep pushing it and pushing it, and yet we couldn't quite get it over the line. It's taken some extraordinary feats. You know, 150 scientists signed a petition that was submitted saying, the science is saying there's a problem with this case, and you can't ignore it. This is a miscarriage of justice. And I think that's really been the impetus here. But that is unheard of, unprecedented, that the science world has got involved in a criminal case to this capacity. And I think that's what's seen the real change here, and that's why it's taken 20 years. What's your understanding of that science, of this evidence that led to the pardon? So shifting gears from the idea that Kathleen Folbig murdered her children versus that they died of natural causes. Yeah, so there's really two parts to this. There's the part of why did the children die. And then there's the diaries, which were so influential in that original trial. The excerpts were read that could be interpreted as reflection of intentional harm to the children. They could also have been interpreted differently. We'll get to that in a moment. So the evidence comes from the genetic sequences of the children. Since 2019, all four of the children's sequences were analysed. 
and it was determined that Sarah and Laura, the two daughters, had a rare genetic mutation which could lead to early death in children with this mutation. And so you have to remember the conviction rested on the fact that there were four children within one family dying of SIDS, which was considered incredibly unusual and just couldn't happen just by chance. We're taking that pattern away now by saying, well, at least two of the children died of this mutation. We also have an explanation for one of the boys' deaths. So there's only one child. We currently don't understand why he died, but that doesn't mean that we'll never understand that because ultimately we don't know a lot of the reasons why children die of SIDS. It's just an umbrella category saying this child died, natural causes, but we're not sure exactly why. It could be genetic, could be environmental, could be a combination. So the science brought us forward to the point where two of the children, their deaths can be explained. So the pattern is now gone. Now, if the conviction rested on a pattern of four deaths and that pattern is now non-existent, then the conviction, I would argue, is unsound. So that's part of it. That's the actual pathology part of it. Then there's the diaries because they were so influential in the original trial. As I said, excerpts were read. I've read the whole diary and nowhere in those diaries did Kath ever say that she intentionally harmed those children. And yet, if you cherry pick, it's easy to choose elements that can read a certain way if that's the context which you're trying to build. And that's ultimately what the prosecution did. So this time, for the first time in the inquiry, they heard from psychologists and psychiatrists who interpreted the language in those diaries and what those experts, and it's the first time experts have analysed them, they concluded that these weren't the words of a woman who was expressing guilt at intentionally harming her children. Rather, they were the guilt expressed by a woman who was losing children and was desperately sad and traumatised and suffering enormous grief at those losses and was feeling as if she was failing to take care of them and they were subsequently dying. So they put a totally different inflection on the words in those diaries. And I think those two things combined together were incredibly powerful at unpicking the narrative that has been painted for the last 20 years of this cold-hearted woman who didn't want the children and was therefore suffocating them. There was never any evidence of suffocation, but that was the conclusion that was drawn because they couldn't decide how else she may have killed them. If these charges were brought today, you know, if we fast forward to 2023 and and we think of a Kathleen Folbig with four babies who have died in a modern context, with everything that we now understand about postnatal depression, with growing understanding of the science behind SIDS, and even if you look at these deaths in isolation, you know, we have a boy who had epileptic seizures, the firstborn who had larynx breathing issues from the moment that he was born, all sorts of situations like that within each individual case of each child. Would charges even be brought at all in 2023, do you think? I don't think they would in 2023. You've got to remember the context when she was originally charged and this began kind of in 2001. What was quite impactful at the time was what was known as Meadows Law. Now, Meadows Law was based on a maxim by a very eminent paediatrician in the UK called Professor Sir Roy Meadows. And he's actually the reason I came across Cass's case, because during my PhD, many, many moons ago now, I reviewed expert evidence of when it can go wrong. And Professor Soroy Meadows came to my attention because he gave evidence in a number of very high profile cases where women were accused of murdering their children. They were subsequently found guilty. But by 2003, this had been totally discredited in the UK, his evidence. And yet, when I got here, I heard about Professor Soro Meadows and this Meadows Law and how influential it was in the charging and prosecution of Kathleen Folbig. And I was like, alarm. Like, I know that this isn't real. This shouldn't be having an influence now. And yet, this discussion was still going on. In the inquiry, just a couple of weeks ago, Meadows Law was mentioned again. And I was like, my mind is going to explode if we keep talking about Professor Soroy Meadows, the untold damage he has done. However, we do understand so much more about the science, about how women respond to trauma, and there is no normal response. We understand much more about the depths of those traumas and how that can express. We also have a lot more knowledge about sudden infant death syndrome. And I think the understanding that just because we can't explain something right now doesn't mean that it's 
sinister or that violence may have occurred. You know, we know that children die of SIDS. We can't explain why, yet we understand that the genes are much more complicated than I think people at first imagined. So I'm hoping in 2023, Meadows Law has diminished enough so that you will never hear those words again because one woman ultimately ended up dying in the UK. She was so traumatised. She was released from prison and yet she was so damaged by the experience that she ended up dying very early. Now, to me, that should be on his conscience and I think what happened to Kath Volpig should be on his conscience too and everyone who applied that maxim inappropriately in Kath's case, I don't believe she ever should have been charged and I hope If there was another Kathleen Folbig now, we would look at things very differently. Kathleen Folbig is out of jail. Is she yet a free woman? Can you talk me through the difference between this idea of being pardoned and exoneration? Sure. They are very different things. So what has happened is a pardon has been granted even before we've had the results of the most recent inquiry. But it was quite clear during that inquiry that everybody agreed that there was reasonable doubt based on the evidence. So everyone was in agreement, which is unheard of again, extraordinary. So the process is now she's been granted a pardon and it came as a shock to everyone. I think we were kind of expecting it, but we didn't know exactly when it was going to happen. So this means that she's basically been released from prison, but she is still guilty of those three murder charges and one manslaughter charge for which she was originally convicted. The process now will be she does want to clear her name. She's always been very clear about that. She does not want to be a convicted murderer, even though she is physically free. She's still carrying around that stigma. The next step will be for the Attorney General to recommend that the case is reverted back to the Criminal Court of Appeal. At that stage, the court could uphold the convictions, but I don't even know what we would do if that happened. Much more likely they will quash those convictions and at that stage she will be deemed innocent. But it's not until that final legal process has taken place will she be not anymore a registered murderer. In terms of the Court of Appeal, the process, the pathway to Kathleen Folbig being found innocent... How long does something like that take? Do we have a roadmap? An appeals process could take a long time. So now she's been pardoned, I imagine her legal team will be working on that process. The Attorney General may recommend that it's now reverted back to the Court of Criminal Appeal. If that takes place, we're looking months, if not kind of a year before it gets there. And then that could take who knows how long, given the courts move incredibly slowly. And which is another injustice, in my opinion, when you're waiting for a final answer. But in the meantime, she will obviously be enjoying her time free on Tracy's farm with the animals because she loves animals. And so, yes, we're looking at, you know, this is not going to be over tomorrow. We're looking months, if not longer. So there's certainly more chapters of this story to unfold yet. There's a lot of speculation about if we get to that stage, a court of appeal quashes this case and Kathleen Folbig is declared innocent, what comes next financially? So I want to talk to you about compensation. How likely is it that that would happen? Are there any precedents for us to look to to understand how it could unfold for Kath? There are. It's very difficult to get compensation for a miscarriage of justice in this country. There's no right to it as somebody who's been wrongfully convicted, certainly not in New South Wales. So as a kind of as a very loose guide, Lindy Chamberlain, I think, got 1.3 million, but that was back in the 90s. She was obviously in prison for a much shorter amount of time, although she was pregnant at the time she went to prison. So it's very difficult to qualify, you know, what would see increases or decreases. I'm not trying to weight them in that sense, but for her pain and suffering, she was awarded $1.3 million. I've heard anywhere between $1 and $20 million in Kathleen Folbig's case. Remember, she's been to prison 20 years of her life. She's been absolutely vilified. I would say she was easily the most hated woman in the country. And still there's going to be a lot of vitriol, I think, levelled at her because some people will still believe, regardless of what the courts say, that she's not guilty. People still ask me about Lindy Chamberlain, which I find incredibly frustrating. Anyone is listening. She did not kill Azaria. Let's not even have that conversation again ever. People still ask me. 
some of my students still ask me, but it's that no smoke without fire. So it's going to be an incredibly difficult road for her. And I think the compensation, if she is awarded it, and I imagine she will be, then it needs to reflect the fact that she has lost 20 years of her life. She's now 55 years old. You can't compensate somebody for that. But remember, she has come out of a prison after 20 years with nothing, the clothes on her back. She has nobody to support her except those who are choosing to. She has nothing, literally nothing. And so $20 million, I think, you know, a million dollars for every year of her life she's lost. You know, I think that would seem reasonable to most people, given she also lost four children, you know, and she's probably never really been allowed to grieve for that. You can obviously never compensate for that either. And so, yes, I believe she will get compensation. I believe she should get compensation. And there will be a huge push for that from her supporters to try and help her with the rest of her life. If she is awarded a significant sum, do you think there's going to be ramifications for the legal system reputationally? Is this perhaps the beginning of of some kind of a reckoning? I actually really hope it is. I think the legal system in Australia needs a reckoning. I think that in other countries we have independent criminal case review commissions, which are separate to the judiciary. They're separate to politicians. And this case is highly political. Don't ever think that it's not. I mean, it took a very brave attorney general to recommend the pardon. Lots of people wanted to see her remain in prison. They wanted the status quo maintained. And so I think this will be a reckoning because in other countries, we do have these independent review commissions. If we'd had one in Australia, there's one in the UK, we've had it for 26 years, I think now there's one in Canada. I think that this may have been referred to them earlier. And therefore, we would not have seen the longevity that we've seen with this particular miscarriage of justice. And I think that the legal system has to acknowledge and will be forced to acknowledge that science will outstrip the pace at which the law changes. There has to be space within that for the law to adapt. And when there is clearly a problem with a case, that that can be addressed. Because at the moment, everyone wants to say, no, this case is over and there's pushback. Whereas you and I and everybody listening to this needs to know that there's accountability, transparency, and somewhere to go when an egregious wrong has clearly happened, it's not acceptable for the law to just go, nope, we've already heard that, we're not interested. If there's a problem, we have to have a way of addressing it. And I'm hoping the legal system will now be forced to adapt and potentially through an independent review commission being established, that will give people hope to address these wrongs when they do happen. Because ultimately, occasionally, the law does get it wrong. Will Kathleen Folbig, in a future where she is proven innocent, where the conviction is quashed, could she face any further action over the deaths of her children? Well, that's also a really interesting legal question. So if the case is referred back to the Criminal Court of Appeal, there is an outside chance that they could quash the convictions but decide to retry, or at least the DPP could retain the right to retry her for these crimes, crimes as they would then label them. However, given what we know about the lack of any forensic or medical evidence to suggest harm, and given the diaries and what everybody in the inquiry accepted, that there is reasonable doubt, I cannot imagine a universe in which they would retain the right to retry. But it is possible. And I've heard about it in other cases where convictions have been overturned. And the DPP has said, well, we accept the court's decision. However, we retain the right to retry. They don't generally do that, but they don't accept that the person is innocent either. They basically just go, well, we still think they might be guilty, but we're just not going to pursue it. And I hope they don't do that because there needs to be a very clear message that Kathleen Folbig is not guilty and that needs to come from all parties. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with forensic anthropologist and criminologist Dr Xanthi Mallet about the release of Kathleen Folbig. In terms of psychologically for Kathleen, where to begin to even pick up the pieces and try and start life anew on the outside, 
For anyone who's been in prison for any amount of time, I'm sure there is so much psychological damage. But particularly for Kathleen Folbig, as you mentioned, the label of the most hated woman in Australia, this alleged child killer, the way that she was condemned publicly and in the media. Can you talk me through a little bit about what that can do to a person? Yeah, I mean, after I wrote my book, one of Kathleen's very good friends contacted me and I actually went to see Kathleen in Silverwater, where she was at the time. And she was in a protected unit of around 20 women who are there for crimes where they can't be released into the general prison community for their own safety. And you've got to remember, I think people don't really grasp that in prison, there's a hierarchy. And those who have harmed children and particularly violent sex offenders, males particularly, are at the bottom of that hierarchy. And they're at risk in prison, at risk from the other prisoners. So Kathleen was housed in this area where it was protected. But certainly it's a very dangerous environment. It's a very intense environment. I think people would struggle to understand how it would feel to be watched all the time, to be monitored all the time, to have every facet of your life controlled and timed from the minute you get up to what you do with your day, to the locking of your door at night and the containment, the fear that you would live through. I mean, Kathleen has been attacked in prison Certainly, I know that when there's been media around her case, when there's been a push for a new inquiry or other kind of high profile movement, she's become a target in prison because she's a high profile inmate. And so I think it's difficult for people to realize how hard it's going to be to reacclimatize to freedom, what that means, not having to keep watch your back all the time, not having to fear for your safety not having somebody lock the door, being able to just, like she was saying with her friend Tracy on the clips you saw yesterday, go and make a cup of tea. She slept for the first time in a real bed. She's made a cup of tea with real, in a real crockery cup and had real spoons to stir with, with, you know, real milk. Things you and I would take for granted, she is going to have to adjust. And she'll be in this state of euphoria at the moment, but it won't have sunk in. And I just... Going forward, and Tracy, her friend and I have spoken about this, she's going to need help to adjust because 20 years in prison, especially a grieving mother who's never really had the chance to grieve properly for her children, it's going to be a huge period of adjustment. And in a lot of the interviews I've done, I've just asked people to be kind and to be respectful of that and to give her the space she needs to adjust. But I've met Kathleen a number of times, and if anyone can do it, she can. She's incredibly strong, and so are the people around her. And so she will be okay, but it's going to take a long time when she comes down off the high to really decide what her life is going to be and work towards that and the traumas she's going to have to manage along the way. As someone who has spent a bit of time with her, what do you think is the most important thing for people to know about Kathleen Folbig? What do you want us to understand about the woman? I want people to understand that the woman that you saw in the media, the very stoic, almost hard-looking woman, is not the true Kathleen Folbig. She has a sense of humour. She's funny. She has a very positive disposition, you know, you'd expect somebody from in her position to be very institutionalized. And in ultimately, in some way, she will be, but she was still very much somebody you could sit down and have a glass of wine with. You know, she is a whole person. She is a kind person. And I think that people believe maybe what they see snippets, they'll see photos, and they'll think, you know, she didn't respond the way that we expected her to, and they'll judge her. But that's not the woman that I met. That's not the woman who was just trying to survive and just wanted justice. And so incredibly strong, but a nice woman who deserves our deepest sympathy and who I wish every luck to in the future that she has a wonderful life now that has been afforded to her. There was a lot made during her trial and, you know, subsequent appeals, inquests, you know, her behaviour or perceived demeanour, I guess is a better way to frame it, of seeming disconnected or emotionally flat. And it echoes very much the public sentiment towards Lindy Chamberlain when she was in court, that these are mothers who should be 
physically being some other way than what they are. Do you think we've learned enough and understand enough about grief now to recognise that it appears differently everywhere in every person? I think there's more of an understanding of that than there was. And I think the same was true of Kelly Lane too. And these are people who are not emotional responders. They don't wear their emotions on the outside. And I guess when I met Kathleen, I've met Kelly too. I can empathize with that because I'm also not like that. If something happened to me and I was charged, I would not be the person in tears. I would be very together, you know, and that's just the way some people respond. And I think we do have a a better understanding now, although I still think we judge especially women, harshly when they don't respond in the way that we we think maybe they should. And I'm hoping that this will break down some of those discussions. She ultimately will speak to the media. She will have to because the media will be interested in what she has to say. The public will be interested. But I think you will get to know a different side of her through those interviews that she will do to have her say now. And I hope that that will give people insight and make them a little more sympathetic and empathetic when they see things and less judgmental. We have heard from Kathleen's ex-husband, the father of the four babies who passed away, and he maintains that she is guilty. This is the man who found the journal entries that he thought were disturbing and took them to police in the very first instance. What do we do with that? What must this time be like for him? Yeah, and my sympathies absolutely go out to Craig, Kathleen's ex-husband. However, there is a reason that jury is not made up of family members, etc. I mean, people become very emotionally involved in these cases. Sometimes people need somebody to blame when they've suffered a, a deep loss and grief. And ultimately, Craig's opinion is simply that. And I'm not kind of downplaying that because you can't really ignore the science. You can't ignore the objective evidence of those geneticists who looked at those genetic profiles. They found the mutations. That evidence is indisputable. It's entirely objective. It's been peer reviewed. It's been assessed by experts all over the world. Those people have no agenda here. They're literally looking for mutations in a genetic sequence. Likewise, with the diaries, they were assessed by people who are experts who are looking for patterns of words, etc. And it's just evidence. So to me, the criminal justice process has to be based on objectivity. There isn't really a place for emotion within that. So with respect to Craig, whatever he may believe, the process has taken place. The experts have spoken. And even the director of public prosecutions acknowledged that there is now reasonable doubt in this case. And that is huge. And if the director of public prosecutions believes that, then I think the public can be assured that this isn't a woman who has been let off. This is a woman who never, in my mind, should have been found guilty in the first place. And ultimately, the evidence is what should speak rather than individual personal opinions, which people have every right to. But that is not what should guide the criminal justice process. And it certainly should not keep somebody in prison. Craig Folbig refused to provide DNA to see if their sons had genetic defects from his side. Is there a missing piece to this puzzle because he never provided his DNA? Could that have sped this process up or is there an opportunity that just hasn't happened there because there's 50% of the DNA that we can't analyse? Well, ultimately there is a piece missing and obviously he has his reasons for not donating his DNA for analysis. Personally, I would want to know if I'd potentially passed on those mutations to my own children that survived. He has a surviving child. So I think there is a piece missing. It certainly would have helped the geneticists if they'd had the entire picture. But ultimately, you know, we do understand that one of the sons had epilepsy and that could easily have led to his early death. All of the children had medical problems at the times of their deaths that had been pre-diagnosed. And so, yes, I think it certainly would have been helpful. It may have expedited things. And I'm sure Craig has his reasons for not wanting his DNA analysed. But I think that many people would want to know, if not to help Kathleen, regardless of how he may feel about her, for his own peace of mind. In terms of the process that we saw unfold this week, you know, for most people just going about their business on Monday morning, it 
probably would have come as a huge shock that, you know, all of a sudden the Attorney General is giving a press conference and pardoning Kathleen Folbig. Would there have been a lot of work going on behind the scenes? When would Kathleen have found out about all of this? And is it done differently for something so high profile? So, yes, there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes. I can't tell you when Kath found out specifically, but certainly there have been lots of discussions going on between lawyers and the Attorney General and a lot of preparations in place. You can't simply pardon somebody and then then walk out of prison. It just doesn't work like that. So she would have had some warning, but that warning would have been minimal, although it's kind of you know, that obviously I was aware of some of the discussions going on and we kind of knew it was coming, but nobody quite knew when. So I imagine it did happen quite quickly in those last hours. But yes, a lot of preparation went into this and discussions have been going on for many weeks now during the inquiry as to the different options, what might happen and how that would be best managed. And the media side of it too, it is incredibly high profile. And obviously, Kath needs protection in that space because it's going to be so overwhelming that the whole media had to be also managed in a way that was going to give her a space once she was released. The way that science is so rapidly advancing and these breakthroughs just keep coming, should we be getting used to the idea that cases will be re-examined, that people might be pardoned? Is this just the beginning? I think there probably ultimately are. I mean, I can't think of any other Australian cases where women have been found guilty of murdering their children, but ultimately there will be cases around the world that the scientific breakthroughs we've seen in this case will ultimately impact. And DNA, people think that you know DNA analysis is kind of static, but ultimately in terms of identification, that's also you know making strides. We're going to learn more about DNA sequences, more information is going to be available as we can continue to analyse smaller and smaller amounts and degrade DNA. And it's going to continue to have huge impacts on both cold cases and people who've been convicted. And so absolutely, we will see more convictions overturned. I'm not expecting there to be a huge number. It's not suddenly going to be a tidal wave of convictions being overturned. But we do know that there are people currently incarcerated who are not guilty And I'm involved with some of that work myself through the University of Newcastle. We have a justice clinic. We work with clients who claim to be wrongfully convicted. And so every now and again, you will hear about a case, you will hear about advances in science that have changed the whole perception, possibly not as monumentally as in this case to go from being Australia's worst female serial killer, most hated woman, to the subject of sympathy and and the conversations I'm hearing now have totally 180'd. On this case, that's quite extraordinary. But yes, you will absolutely hear about more breakthroughs that will change the face of cases and the way that we look at some prosecutions going forward. Does that then give an even more urgent need for this idea of an independent body? You mentioned earlier in the UK, they have one already established in New Zealand and Canada. There's one established already where these reviews of these miscarriages of justice are done by an independent body at a high level. If science is going to continue to offer us these breakthroughs, as we know it will, is it then more important than ever that we establish one of these bodies? I think the history of what's happened in the UK and Canada, as you say, New Zealand, has shown that these bodies have a really important role to play. I don't think that they do the criminal justice system any harm. I think they reinforce it. They demonstrate when it's working, but they also are a mechanism to put things right when it's not working. And I think that's in everybody's interest. We all want the right people to be in prison and we all want the right people to be found not guilty. So I think that it will certainly strengthen that case. And it definitely needs to be independent because you have to take the politics out of this. You have to take out the criminal justice system because it's too It has too strong a part to play in the original conviction, and I think it needs to be fully independent so that people have faith that there is somewhere to go that we all need to know it works properly, right? That's in everyone's interest. So, yes, and I'm hoping that this may be an outcome of this awful situation. A woman has lost 20 years of her life, but a positive could be this independent review commission that could prevent there ever being another Kathleen Forbig case in Australia. You've spoken to Kathleen's best friend, Tracy Chapman, who has stood by her, who has chosen to be there for her through this. What does Tracy hope is around the corner for Kath Folbig? What does she want for her friend? 
wow, I think she just wanted freedom. You know, I think that that was the end goal. And she set up somewhere for Kath to live and she's going to, you know, help her get a new start. I think she wants Kath to start living now. She's had 20 years taken away and she wants to make up for those 20 years. But I think it's going to be difficult to actually acknowledge what has happened, you know, that everyone has been waiting for her to be free. And it was always hard to see that in the future we waited so long. So I think she wants her friend to have peace, to have whatever she wants in her life. You know, she may want to go back to university and get an education and get a job and do all those normal things that you and I take for granted that have been taken away from her. And ultimately, I think she just wants her to have the chance of happiness and freedom. And so I think that will be such a huge thing for Kath going forward. And ultimately, Tracy and Helen Cummings, huge supporters, and they will continue to support Kath going forward. Thank you so much to Xanthi for joining us on today's episode to talk through the release of Kathleen Folbig this week. Xanthi has her own true crime podcast. It's called Motive and Method. And if you want to listen to that, you'll find a link in the show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted and produced by me, Emma Gillespie, with audio design by Tegan Sadler. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation. <laughs>